Hello and welcome to a geopolitical tour of the world. In this video I'm going to take you on a guided journey around the globe talking to you about some disputes, oddities, complexities or just some things that are good to be aware of in this complicated planet we live on. Some of the things I'll be talking about I already have entire videos on if you want a deeper understanding. We'll start at the centre of the world, the Prime Meridian, which goes through Greenwich, England. This is because that's where the British invented time in 1884. Here we have two independent countries, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. The country of Ireland comprises the majority of the island of Ireland while the northern part, called Northern Ireland, is one of the four constituent countries of the United Kingdom. Northern Ireland doesn't really have an official flag because its population doesn't exactly agree on whether they should remain British or unite with the rest of Ireland. The other three constituent countries are in Great Britain and surrounding minor islands, Scotland, England and Wales. Some people use the terms Great Britain, United Kingdom and England interchangeably, but please don't, as Scots really don't appreciate it. In fact, many Scots don't want to be part of the UK. Despite an unsuccessful referendum in 2014, there's still a very sizeable independence movement, even more so since Brexit. So just remember, Great Britain, an island. The UK, an independent country made up of four non-independent countries, and England, one of those four countries. Oh, and there's also the Isle of Man, Jersey and Guernsey, which are British but not part of the UK for some reason. They're referred to as Crown Dependencies. Okay, we really need to move on, lots to cover. If we go into the icy north, we find the Faroe Islands and Greenland, two places that you wouldn't think have much in common, but they do. They're both Danish. They're both autonomous territories of Denmark, and despite the immense difference in size between the two, they actually both have a similar population of around 50,000. Unsurprisingly, Greenland is one of the least densely populated parts of the world. The island is literally three quarters ice. Now moving on to land with a more hospitable climate, mainland Europe. First thing to talk about is probably the European Union, an economic and political union of 27 European states. It used to be 28, but, you know, Brexit. Now the EU has what's called the Schengen Area, an area of free travel in which participating countries have abolished border controls. Not all members of the EU are part of this area and also some non-EU members are. Same with the Eurozone, a monetary union in which all countries use a shared currency, the Euro. 19 of the 27 members are part of the Eurozone, 4 countries have agreements with the EU to officially use the Euro despite not being part of the EU, and then 2 others just sort of decided they wanted it too without any agreement in place. Now given how much Europeans loved conquering the world for a few centuries, there are plenty of parts of European countries outside of Europe like the large part of France in South America or smaller islands just off the coast of Madagascar. Of course, I won't be able to cover them all. Just a quick mention about the Vatican City, which is considered a country, the smallest in the world, entirely surrounded by Italy, but is not a member of the United Nations, although it is an observer state. Okay, to Spain next. This region here is called Catalonia. It's one of the 17 autonomous communities of Spain. Many Catalans have been fighting for independence from Spain over the last century, with things really picking up over the last decade. Catalonia sought permission from Madrid to hold an independence referendum. Spain said no. Catalonia said they'll do it anyway. Spain said wait no, that's illegal, but they did it anyway. The result was 92% in favour of independence, but everyone who wanted to remain part of Spain just boycotted the vote, so it doesn't really count. The president of Catalonia later declared independence, sort of. It was all very confusing and nobody really knows what happened. Catalonia is still part of Spain though and their former president is currently living in self-imposed exile in Belgium. On the southern coast of the Iberian Peninsula there is Gibraltar, an overseas British territory which was ceded from Spain about 300 years ago. And just across the Mediterranean there's a couple of parts of Africa that are still part of Spain. Alright, what's next? Ah yes, the Balkans. This is a part of Europe in which everyone hates each other. Probably the biggest point of contention is the self-declared, partially recognised state of Kosovo, or the autonomous Serbian province of Kosovo, depending on your viewpoint. The province declared its independence in 2008, after a war with Serbia a few years earlier, in which Kosovo received military support from NATO. The population of Kosovo is predominantly Albanian. 
As well as this, there was also the near three decade naming dispute between Greece and Mas uh, North Macedonia, as it's now called. Basically, Macedonia is a large geographic region, much of which is in Greece and was named as such after an ancient Greek kingdom of Macedon. So Greece wasn't too happy in 1991 when their neighbour declared independence from Yugoslavia as the Republic of Macedonia. Due to Greek objections, the country was referred to as the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia in diplomatic organisations like the UN. After 28 years, the insanity was finally ended and the country was renamed the Republic of North Macedonia. But I'm pretty sure neither side was really happy with the outcome and they both still hate each other. On to Russia now. This is the Crimean Peninsula. It was annexed by Russia from Ukraine in 2014, after a referendum of questionable legitimacy. It was only actually part of Ukraine for about half a century, since it was transferred to Ukraine while both were Soviet republics. Western governments and the UN do not recognise the annexation and still consider the peninsula to be part of Ukraine. Nothing has actually been done about it though. One more part of Russia that's good to be aware of is the small exclave here called the Kaliningrad Oblast. It was originally part of the German state of Prussia, but the Soviet Union claimed it after the Allies' victory in World War II, and then after the fall of the Soviet Union it became completely cut off from the rest of Russia. Now travelling to Russia's southern border with Georgia, Georgia has a somewhat precarious political situation as it has not one but two parts of the country that have declared their independence, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Both states have control over the areas they claim, however they very much lack international recognition. Both states declared their independence in the 1990s with backing from Russia. There was even a brief war over the dispute between Georgia and Russia in 2008. No prizes for guessing how that turned out. Next we'll take a trip down to the Mediterranean to the beautiful summer getaway of Cyprus. The political situation here though is a bit ugly. The island is currently divided between the country of Cyprus and the unrecognised Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. There's a UN buffer zone separating the two political entities that was established after the inter-ethnic violence between the Greeks and the Turks of the island erupted in the 1960s shortly after Cyprus gained independence from the UK. There was a Greek coup followed by a Turkish invasion and it all got very messy. Oh, and there's also some British bases on that island, I guess the strategic location was just too valuable to give up. Moving further south and on to Africa. Probably the most noticeable geopolitical dispute in Africa is the area known as Western Sahara. The region is claimed and mostly controlled by Morocco, but the region has also been proclaimed as the independent country of the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic by the indigenous rebel group the Polisario Front, which started off by fighting against Spanish colonial rule in the 1970s. In 1976, Spain just sort of noped out of the whole situation and divided the region between Morocco and another neighbouring country Mauritania, who also claimed the region at the time, but not anymore. On the opposite coast of Africa we have Somaliland, which once again is a dispute caused by the Europeans. Somaliland was controlled by the British, while the rest of what is today the country of Somalia was controlled by Italy. In 1960, the two were joined to make a new, independent country. Somaliland declared independence in 1991 and a civil war has been ongoing ever since. Now moving on to the Middle East. Oh, Okay, so it's quite literally impossible to give any kind of explanation of what the hell is going on here in just a couple of minutes, so just keep in mind that everything I say is going to be way oversimplified. Before the beginning of the currently ongoing situation, there was an area called Palestine, which was under British administration. In 1948, the United Nations passed a resolution to partition the land between Jewish and Arab communities. The descendants of these Arab communities in this region and in refugee camps nearby are what we today call Palestinians. After the resolution was passed, the state of Israel was declared. This led to the first of several wars with its neighbours, in which Israel was often fighting against most or all of them at once. Territory in this region has bounced back and forth between different countries and organisations many times. Today Israel is also in control of the Golan Heights, which it captured from Syria in 1967. Now as well as Israel, we also have the state of Palestine, declared in 1988, which is a partially recognised state with observer status at the United Nations. Its claimed territory is the West Bank, in which an interim division agreement was reached with Israel in the 90s, as well as the Gaza Strip, which has actually been controlled by Hamas since 2007, a Palestinian political party and variously described as a terrorist organisation. Things are even more complicated in Jerusalem, an ancient city with profound significance to Jews, Muslims and Christians. The city is fully controlled by Israel, but claimed by both groups as their capital, 
though with different parts of the city being claimed by each group. On top of all of this, there's also the issue of Israeli settlements, which we don't have time to get into and I'd really like to move on now, please. Staying in the Middle East, there's the situation in Syria, in which a devastating, multi-sided civil war has been ongoing for nearly 10 years now. This began with a series of anti-government protests, part of a broader movement known as the Arab Spring, which was violently suppressed. The conflict is one of the bloodiest of the 21st century and has spilled over to several neighbouring countries. There's also the situation in Iraq. There is still ongoing conflict that stemmed from the US-led invasion in 2003 to topple the government of Saddam Hussein. With ISIS having mostly lost their territory in Iraq, the violence has continued in the form of an insurgency featuring several rebel groups. ISIS was defeated in the civil war with help from the Kurds, a distinct ethnic group in northern Iraq that is seeking independence. The people overwhelmingly voted in favour of independence, but the Iraqi government deemed the referendum illegal. Alright, let's move east of the Middle East and onto the Indian subcontinent, where we find the disputed region of Jammu and Kashmir. Basically, this area was a princely state of India while under British control, and in 1947, when India was divided into India and Pakistan, disagreements about which country to join caused conflict and a de facto partition of the region that remains unresolved to this day. Around here there's also several territorial disputes between India and China along their extensive border, all of which are controlled by China. And speaking of China, there's plenty here to talk about too. We've got Tibet, Hong Kong, Taiwan and probably much more we don't have time for. So Tibet. Tibet is an autonomous region of the People's Republic of China. The Tibetan people are ethnically distinct from the Han Chinese majority, but the area has been under Chinese control for 300 years. However, when imperial rule in China came to an end with the fall of the Qing Dynasty in 1912, Tibet experienced a few decades of de facto independence. This is when China became a republic for the first time. However, when a civil war broke out between the government and the communist rebellion, the communists won and proclaimed the People's Republic of China. The new communist government annexed Tibet in 1951, albeit with resistance from Tibet's 8,000 strong army. Now, that civil war that was won by the communists, the losing side, the Republic of China, didn't just disappear. In fact, this brings us on to our next stop, Taiwan. This is where the Republican slash nationalist government fled to in 1949. While this country is commonly referred to as Taiwan, its name is actually unchanged to this day, the Republic of China. China still views Taiwan as part of its territory despite the People's Republic never having any jurisdiction over the island in their history. Taiwan has its own government, president, military, etc, etc, and it's just like any other country in most ways. However, given how powerful China is, officially acknowledging Taiwan means China cutting all ties, both diplomatic and, more importantly, economic. Taiwan is not a member of the UN, but plenty of countries have unofficial relations with Taipei. There's also Hong Kong, which is part of China but has a special administrative status under the so-called One China Two Systems policy. Mass protests took place throughout much of 2019 when a controversial extradition bill was proposed. Even after the bill was withdrawn, protests continued for full democracy with a list of five demands. Protesters were often subject to police brutality and arrest. Hong Kong used to be British until 1997 when it was transferred back to China with a 50-year agreement that Hong Kong would not be subject to mainland China's economic system. Literally no one knows what will happen in 2047 when this agreement expires. Close by there's also North and South Korea. Korea had been annexed by Japan in 1910 but with the Japanese defeat in World War II, the peninsula was to be temporarily divided. The Soviet Union controlled the North and the United States the South, with the plan to unify Korea into one country. But then the Cold War happened and suddenly the two countries controlling Korea hated each other and were less willing to cooperate. There was a three year war which didn't really accomplish much except massive casualties on both sides. North Korea is the most isolated country in the world, with its population unable to leave and with little knowledge of the outside world. North Korea has nuclear weapons though, hence the lack of intervention. Elsewhere in Asia to be aware of, there's a country that nobody really knows what to call it, Burma or Myanmar, and there's also the South China Sea, which is the most disputed part of the entire planet, claimed by like 
40 countries or something, probably. Where do we go from here? Uh, we can probably just skip over Australia and all that down there. They're pretty chill, not too much to talk about. Let's instead go all the way across the Pacific Ocean, which is mostly empty except for Hawaii, which is part of the United States but has a Union Jack on its flag for some reason. So now we're in the Americas, North and South America, although some people, especially from Latin America, refer to them as one continent, America, singular. However, English speakers generally use this word to refer to the country, the United States. There's plenty going on in the Caribbean. There are 13 independent nations, most of which no one has ever heard of, as well as European colonies and territories, and also a random part of Colombia. Cool flag though. Oh, and Puerto Rico that wants to awkwardly add a 51st star to the American flag. A particularly peculiar case is with a bunch of Dutch islands, Aruba, Curaçao and St Martin, which are actually countries within the Kingdom of the Netherlands, making up four constituent countries along with the Netherlands itself. Somewhat similar to the UK. But within the constituent country of the Netherlands, there are three more Caribbean islands, Bonaire, St Eustatius and Seba. Here's a Venn diagram to help you out. Elsewhere in the Americas, there's the Falkland Islands, British islands with British people who near unanimously voted to remain a British territory, but for some reason Argentina claims them as their own. They even fought a brief war in 1982 when Argentina invaded the islands, but this only happened because the dictator was trying to distract his people from the country's failing economy. Let's see, what else? Well, there's Antarctica, which is mostly just ice and snow, but hey, it's land, so countries will try and stick a flag in it and claim it as their own because why not at this point? There are various claims to the continent, some of which overlap, as well as some unclaimed land, but it's mostly irrelevant because of the Antarctic Treaty. The treaty has suspended all new claims, guarantees freedom for scientific exploration, and a ban of all military activity. Sometimes when we look at the world, the lines on a map don't fully do justice to the situation on the ground. You often have to look beyond the borders to see what lies beneath. Geopolitics can be both complicated and fascinating in equal measure and it's always good to know what's going on in the world. A great way to keep yourself informed is by watching documentaries on CuriosityStream, an online streaming service with thousands of titles on science, technology, history, lifestyle and so much more. I recently watched a great documentary about tsunamis and how scientists are trying to learn more and more about them to help better prepare for future disasters. You can start watching for just $2.99 a month by signing up at curiositystream.com forward slash wonder why. With your subscription, you'll also get access to Nebula, a streaming service for independent creators. Nebula has a lot of original content, such as the multi-creator series Working Titles, a series dedicated to TV shows with great opening title sequences. Recently, I made an episode about the greatest sitcom of all time. Go check it out. Again, that's curiositystream.com forward slash wonder why. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time.